All right. Well, welcome everybody to episode four. We're so excited that you're listening and joining us today. Um, today we have a special guest joining uh, the Parkway podcast and his name is Doug Gould. And uh, Doug is, I've known Doug for a while and uh, I think I, we met in 2007. It, it, I think it's 2007, it might be 2008, but I really think it's 2007. And so uh, we go way back and um, Doug is uh, f- from Worship MD, uh, worshipmd.com. And uh, Doug, before we get started, I'd, why don't you just share with everybody a little bit about Worship MD, who you are, and a little bit about your background. Okay. Well, Worship MD stands for market development. And that came as an outgrowth after I was uh, let go from Sure after seven years. Um, market development at Sure meant talking to end users directly and showing them how to use my, we didn't have anything to do with the sales channel, anything like that. It was all about going out and talking to end users. How do I use mics? How do I use in-ear monitors? How do I mix? So so I did that for seven years along with artist relations. And when that job ended, uh, the Lord basically had given me a job from a secular company to talk to churches, which is like, that doesn't happen very often. Yeah. So when that job went away, I was like, Oh no, what do I do now? And the Lord basically said, I just want you to continue with the mission. All right, how do I do that? I don't have any support. He goes, what do missionaries do when they lose support? They look for new support. So as soon as I had that thought in my mind, Audio Technica called me. They were my first client. And then PreSonus joined, Aviom joined. I've had companies come and go, but Aviom and, uh, I'm sorry, AT, Audio Technica, and PreSonus were with me for almost 10 years. And uh, so Sure for seven, Audio Technic for 10. I have Earthworks as a client now who replaced AT. Yamaha replaced PreSonus. So I'm an audio guy. I've been around microphones my whole life from rock bands after the Navy, even before that, recording studios. I think musicians make the best techs. You might argue with me that, but. <laughs> Depends yeah. on the musician, but yeah, yeah. I'd agree with it. No argument. <laughs> if you, I, if I would you, argue with that a little bit. You would? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I just think it's because of the development of the ear. Sure. And a lot sure. of guys in churches, especially who might know a lot about tech, IT, <laughs> but right. they never listen to music. Right, 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 so right, right. Their mixes suffer. You might make a great system tech, but let do somebody else do the mixing. Yeah, the art is the thing that sometimes they get caught up it's, in. It's, it's, I don't disagree that there's art and science involved, but you know, I'm going to lean more towards somebody who has more of a an ear for music yes. to do the actual mixing than the guy who might tune the system or be great with a soldering iron, you know? So. Yeah. <laughs> it's funny though, isn't it, Yeah. I work with a lot of small churches. I am, uh, Christian and Michael take care of a lot of our bigger clients, bigger church clients, but in the small churches, when it's all volunteers, if you go back to the booth and look who's there, it's all engineers. Yeah. Engineer, yeah. not audio mm-hmm. engineers. I'm talking right. like, no, that's right. Software engineer, all these guys that aren't afraid of knobs, but have no idea what to do with them. Right, <laughs> right, sorry right, to our, right, right. Sorry to our yeah. clients who are listening. <laughs> I probably shouldn't have said it that way. No, it's certainly a good like, ear. It goes a lot farther than not being afraid of a knob. It's very different because when I walked up to the board, I didn't care how it was plugged in or anything. As long as it worked, you just let me do the art. That you know? same here, same here. Absolutely, it's all about I the could care art less how and the, the PA music. Was tuned. Yep, you know. And then you learn all those things and then you get better. Yeah. You know, it helps. Better, right? It helps. It's sure. it's a both and, but yes, it's musical first for sure. What's hard about being a tech as a volunteer in a church is they don't have a place to practice. That's why I love digital yeah. mixers so much because now with the uh, inception of virtual sound checks, they can record any Sunday service, go back in when the church is empty and practice learning the gear learning how to group things, mute things, EQ things, compress things. The old days, you had to call Louie in on a Wednesday. He says, would you do this for like a half an hour while I set my compression scheme? <laughs> oh, man, absolutely. I just went through this in my own church. Not, and Michael helped me through the whole thing, but it was an uh, absolute game changer. We, mm-hmm. we have a small church of about uh, 500 families, seat, right. maybe two, 300. And put in an SQ console for the first time. and. Michael introduced us to virtual sound check and it was an absolute game changer. It's amazing. It, it definitely well, it's is. It's amazing. What a help. Yep. What a help. 
Yeah. Take, anyway. Yeah. Yeah. yeah absolutely. Background for we talking about microphones. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Absolutely. Well, thanks, Doug, for sharing that. And they do kind uh, of go together. Yeah. Today we are going to be talking about microphones, <laughs> and um, we're going to kind of take let Doug take the, kind of the reins a little bit. I know he's going to be sharing some content with us, and as he's going, we're going to be interjecting and asking questions and kind of playing devil's advocate um, to situations and what we think our listeners would really want to know. Um, but there's a lot to dive into here. So Doug, why don't you, uh, why don't you get us started with, uh, with uh, microphones and, and uh, what your thoughts are on it? Okay. Well, I'm going to use the PowerPoint to screen share with this and we'll go through some of the slides. You don't have to go through all of them, but you know, if you want to skip ahead, we can, but I want your viewers to know that if they want this PowerPoint, I'm glad to send it to them. Great. So, uh, they can just email me, Doug at worshipmd.com, and I'll send them a Dropbox link because it's too big to email. And uh, they, they can go through it themselves with their team at their church if they want. They have specific questions about a slide or two. Just email me, and I'll answer it as best as I can. And uh, how's that sound? That sounds awesome. Yeah, let's get it going. Perfect. So before you mic anything, we have to make sure that the source is correct. Because I get a question all the time. Hey, what's a great mic for a kick drum? Well, how does your kick drum sound? Uh, it's not so great. Oh, well. <laughs> yeah, tune <laughs> that <drum> first. <laughs> it's going to make a bad kick drum sound better or make Sister Lucy sing in tune. You know, right. it's like not until they put auto tune in a microphone. And I, you know, I don't. I hope they Ooh. don't do that. Don't Ooh. That. <laughs> you, got, you got me thinking now. <laughs> I'm about to go on Shark Tank. <laughs> I just hope they practice their craft, tune their instruments, put new strings on the guitar, mm. tune the heads on the drums, which probably haven't been tuned in 50 years, and make sure the thing sounds as good as you can get it to start with, right? right? Get the rings out of it. Uh, so that's where it starts. Once the, the source is great, now we can move on to choosing the proper microphone and maybe the right place to put it, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So let's let's Amen. start it up there. I'll share my screen now. Let's do it, baby. And uh, Doug, where are you located, man? I'm in New Jersey. New Jersey, yeah. Wow. So I'm originally from New York. New Jersey. I'm originally days, from New York, and uh, New York, and with COVID, everything is crazy over there. And Jersey's number two on that list, and then Michigan, surprisingly, is number three on that list. Isn't that yeah. Funny? yeah. Yeah. So I'm Bronze glad metal. you're staying safe over there, man. <laughs> Oh, we're not the side of the state we're, we're on, though. Yeah. 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 I'm surprised we're not all wearing face masks right now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we're Very all staying contagious. safe at home, guys. So during this well, corona... We, about uh, that. Make sure you clean your microphones. <laughs> yes. I'm a big believer in Lysol wipes for microphones. Yes. Right. Especially yeah, while you're pre-recording all these inside. services. A little yeah. foam thing inside the grill. Take that out and wash it. You can wash it. About works. You know, they have stainless steel mesh inside their their uh, grill. I actually learned that from you back in uh, over ten years, uh, fourteen years ago, and uh, yeah, that was a great tip. Still yeah, I mean, use if you it put to a this microphone day. Under a microscope, you would never sing into that thing. <laughs> Absolutely. Even before the pandemic. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so what are we looking at here? So here's my info. If anybody wants to get a hold of me, that's how to do it. Um, oh, well, we're not seeing the PowerPoint right now. You aren't? No, we're seeing no. a folder. A folder oh, That's list. weird. Okay. Yeah, do you not... Um... Oh, yeah, there it is. I just saw your mouse. Did you see it now or no? No, maybe unshare. Maybe unshare your screen and then go back to it. Okay. Where's that IT guy? We were just there it about? is. Boom. There we go. That's what I'm talking about. There's your info. <laughs> Call him on his cell, everybody. All at the same time, please. Yeah. So the IT guy right now is going, see you dummies. I didn't tell you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You so need me. There now. You need me. <laughs> yeah, well. Yeah, well. You we can take your IP address and you know what to do with it, okay? <laughs> <laughs> All right. <laughs> All right, so let's, let's start with what a microphone is. It's the same thing as a speaker. It's a transducer, right? So transducers obviously are devices that take one kind of energy and convert it to a different kind. 
So a loudspeaker takes electrical energy from an amplifier and turns it into acoustic. And a microphone does just the opposite. It takes acoustic energy, turns it into electrical. Mm. Okay? And there's different types of mics, but the thing that stays consistent in a microphone is the diaphragm. Although the operating principle might be different. One might be a moving coil, which we'll talk about. One might be a condenser or a capacitor, as they call them in Britain. Might be a ribbon. So there's different types of how they actually do the conversion. Okay? If we're looking at a moving coil, well, here's a little instance too. Can a, can a transducer, a loudspeaker, be used as a microphone? If they do the same thing but opposite, that means I should be able to use a transducer speaker as a microphone, like in this case. Right. Or if you have a more elegant version, the Yamaha Subkick. Which they don't sell anymore, and I'm really I sad about. The red mic stand, by the way. That's but, but there are yeah, the <laughs> vice there are grip. Companies that are doing it. There's like a little company called Seducer. There's another one called Subducer. I don't know if they're as good as the Yamaha, but the in essence, this is what I use. Yeah, and it's. Just I speaker. built my own back in the day too. Yeah, you the truck. The trick was finding a speaker small enough because if you had use like a twelve right. inch speaker, it would be just be way too much. Yeah, um, but I think DW also makes one as well now. Yeah, I think there's a lot of companies making them. And, and the idea is, can I, but how about a microphone for a loudspeaker? Can you do that? Um, can you? But every time you drive through a McDonald's yeah. drive through in the old days, yeah. you had one thing that mm. was the speaker and the microphone. Mm -hmm. And depending where the button was, it was a mic or is reading back your order. Wow, I didn't Which know that. the fries wrong all the time. Anyway. <laughs> now they have a small mic and a big speaker. If you notice, most of the drive through windows have dedicated mic and speaker now. But in the old days, they didn't. And one time I was phoning in for a DJ. I'm not a DJ. I don't know how to, you know, <laughs> do that stuff. But his headphones broke. So there's an old SM58 lying around, and I had a soldering iron. I soldered a headphone jack on it, and I used it for a Q phone for about <laughs> two seconds before it burst into flames. I love it. <laughs> if you only had a picture. <laughs> anyway, that just 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 an illustration of how they can work. Uh, opposite when you wire them the correct way. So these are the mic classifications that we we know that we usually work with. And churches, I would say, are going to be mostly small churches anyway on the top one, moving coil, SM58, SM57. Those are dynamic microphones. You get into things like SM86, SM87, you know, uh, Sennheiser, Sure, AT. A lot of companies make great condensers, but a lot of churches don't either can't afford them or don't have any. I still see choirs mic'd with SM58s, which is a big no-no. Right, right. <laughs> because they don't have the sensitivity or the frequency <laughs> response that a condenser has. And ribbons are probably even more rare in a church. You'll see them more in studios. And uh, for the longest time, they were just naturally bi-directional. They picked up from front and back, which made them hard to use live. But now we're actually seeing people baffle the back of them, using them in guitar amp cabinets yeah. and stuff. Yeah. Uh, and they're a lot more affordable and more durable than they used to be. Anyway. So let's look at dynamics for a minute. Dynamic mic, if you look at a blown up diagram of it, looks just like a loudspeaker. You got a diaphragm, you got a, a coil of wires that's attached to the diaphragm that when vibrations hit the diaphragm moves that coil of wire over a magnet, which creates what? Current. Mm hmm Magnetic induction, they call it. And it's a crude device because it's heavy, but it actually works pretty well on a live stage as long as you use it close. Close to the source. You start getting too far away from the thing, there's not enough acoustic energy to make the coil move. Mm. <laughs> you follow me? Yep. It's got weight to it. So you got to put some energy into it to make that heavy coil move back and forth. And if you're too far away, as in with a choir or an overhead mic, you're not going to get the same kind of gain or EQ out of it. Does that make sense? Absolutely. Yep. So they work great as long as you use them close, close to a snare drum, close to a kick drum, close to a guitar cabinet. And yes, even with a vocalist close to her lips which we see people singing from their belly button 
I don't care if it's a condenser or a dynamic, you're not going to sound good from there. If God right. wanted you to sing from there, he would have put lips where your navel is, but he did. <laughs> so far, so good. So far, so good. So yeah, man. Up. And uh, I love me a good SM57 to just kind of use on everything, but um, dynamic microphones are uh, absolutely great to use for close up miking. They are. And, you know, especially if you have loud sources, mm -hmm. they'll take a lot of bang, a lot of input without distorting. Right. And you don't need any extra kind of stuff to worry about. You no know, require external power like a condenser does. Right. The thing you'll notice, though, is they can't make them small enough. So if you ever see a tiny little microphone, like a sub-miniature lapel or a head-worn, that can't be a dynamic because they can't make mm -hmm. the voice coil that small. Yeah, I think the um, the smallest I've seen that's dynamic might be that Sennheiser clip-on mic that you can put on toms and snares, right? What, what model is that? I forget what model yeah. it is. Even the head worn that Madonna wore, that was a, a dynamic, but it was big. Oh, yeah, it was. It was huge. It was the Britney Spears, right? Yeah. <laughs> Not like the Countryman or anything you see now, which are really tiny. Right. Know? So that's just a clue. You yeah. can't make dynamics that <clears throat> small. Yeah. So size is a limitation. Right. You might want to consider a condenser to get into certain spots and things like on a violin or something like that. Right? Okay. Um, okay. Response limits due to the mechanical aspects, uh, gain and frequency. Dynamics are never going to have the wide open frequency response of a condenser. It just can't. They're limited. Um, unless they're voiced specifically for a range, like a, like a beta, uh, 52. Mm -hmm. It's a kick drum mic. Mm -hmm. So they'll voice it so it's really good in the low end. I guess you could mic a flute with a beta 52, but it probably wouldn't sound that great. Right. Unless you're just looking for a different sound. That'd yeah. look great on camera. Yeah. <laughs> or it's tough tape to the pastor's head. That might be Yeah. yeah. <laughs> all right, let's move on. Condensers are really different. They don't even look like a, a speaker at all. They look like a capacitor, which is what they are, like a circuit. Mm. Everybody knows what a capacitor is. It's something that stores a charge. So in this case, when you have an electric condenser like this, that little purple sliver you see in the front is the diaphragm. And that's way, way smaller and thinner than that of a dynamic. That's about the thickness of one micron, which is like a human hair. That's wow. how thin it is. Sometimes it's sputtered with, with a metal or gold, which makes it conductive. Then that blue thing in the back, that's the back plate. That's got a permanent charge fixed to it, too. So what happens is when uh, vibrations, acoustic vibrations, hit that front diaphragm, what's going to happen between the diaphragm and the back plate is a polarity change. How much is a polarity shifting one way or the other, which determines your current? Mm. Okay. You need phantom power for these things because there's electronics in a condenser microphone. People don't know what external power is. It's usually derived from your mixer. There's a little button that might say 48V, and that sends power down the microphone cable, which is why it's called phantom. It's not an external AC cable or anything that plugs into the microphone. Now, if you don't have a microphone or a sound check that's not working, you might not know that's a condenser. Maybe he went out and bought a condenser this weekend, and you don't know it. But before you hit phantom power, mute the channel or pull the fader down, hit 48 volt. If that fixes it, fine. If not, now you got 10 other things to check. Is it the channel? Is it the mic? Is it the cable? Whatever, right? Right. So the advantage of condensers is sensitivity. You just about breathe on that thing and you got sound. Mm -hmm. They'll pick up lots more than a dynamic micro, frequency-wise and gain-wise. So people ask me all the time, what's the, what's the best microphone in the world, Doug? I'll say, what's the application? <laughs> well, it's a worship leader standing in front of a drum set, singing. How far in front of the drum set? Three feet. Do not use a condenser. Mm -hmm. That'll be the best microphone the drum drums ever sounded in your church. <laughs> if it's the worship leader's vocal mic. Does that mean you can't use them? No, but he'll have to stand over there or move the drums over there. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. you just got to watch and observe. Like, sound is like a billiard ball. Where's that thing going to go? Look at the trajectory of any sound coming into the field of pickup of that thing. 
And if it looks like it could get into it, then you're going to have to move something. Right. People don't do that enough. They don't move stuff. <laughs> they just try to fix it technically. Oh, I'll, I'll EQ it out. Yeah, right, 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 right. No, you're go up on stage and move it. Yeah. You know. They got a monitor Imagine coming right into, the, right into the pickup pattern of the microphone. Oh, don't move the monitor. Just, yeah. just like ring it out. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right? Wouldn't it be simpler to move stuff so people can hear easier or eliminate problems? Absolutely. Never put a choir next to a drum set. I mean, if you've been a technical director at any church, you know that that is the cardinal rule. Uh, choir on one side of the stage, drums on the other side of the stage. Exactly. Yeah. Right. You don't put a drum set near anything. <laughs> This is this That's is the my, drum shield. This is my big beef with plexiglass screens. Right. I read this article where the guy in the first paragraph said, "You never want to put a a big loud PA system in a gymnasium because of the reflections." Same second paragraph says, "But you also want to mitigate the drum sound by putting plexiglass around the drums." A so reflective you, surface. You just contradicted yourself. <laughs> right. Right. You're about the loudest right, yeah. thing in a reflective space. Now you're talking about the loudest instrument, and you purposely put it into a fish tank. Right. And that mm -hmm. screws up sound of drums like you can't even believe. I've I've recorded drums with a mic on every drum, and soloed it up without the screen. And says, "Which one am I soloing?" And people are able to identify it. Right. But I take the same exact drum set and put a shield around it. I say, which mic am I soloing now? And nobody can tell me. The overhead sounds like the kick. Right. The snare sounds like the tom because of all the immediate reflections back into all the mics at the same time. That's a great point. It's yeah. Really yeah. When we were in Getty and we recorded our um, our EP there, um, you know, normally they do have the drums because they're in the round. They have the drums inside a full drum cage, right? That's built um, out of aluminum. And, uh, but when we recorded the drums, we took it out of that, you know, location and put it in the middle of the room so that we can get some great reverb through the room and all that. But we actually took it out because of those same issues. We don't want that. We, we definitely want definition from each microphone in order to really translate the drums as uh, accurately as possible. Yeah. What sounds more natural? My voice right now into this microphone or does this sound more natural? Right. 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 <laughs> You know, for an instrument that was designed for war, you think you're going to mitigate that kind of acoustic energy with a quarter inch piece of plexiglass? <laughs> now, it does help with the band members on stage, right, from getting um, the bleed over into either their microphone or live if they're using not in-ears, but using stage wedges. Um, well, I, I would say that in a smaller space where you're more tightly together, because you don't have the space to move out like in a big mega church or something, then why don't you just use smaller instruments that are designed more for tone than for projection? Right. In our little tiny church where we used to meet, we could never have a drum set. It was either a cajon or a djembe or something like that because a drum set just wouldn't, especially the drum set that this guy had, you know, like, like Neil Peart's drum set. It's not going to work in there. Yeah. But you have a nice small kit. There's a lot of beautiful kits out little there. Little jazz there. kits there's and stuff. Well, I think there's a there's a drum company called Adoro. That's you out of Adoro. That's out of Germany. Yeah. It's a really small worship kit. Yep. And there's the a, Yamaha there's, just came out with one at NAM and there's a Chris Tomlin's original drummer, Joey Parrish. If you're if your viewers want to look up Joey Parrish Designs with one R, he makes these beautiful kits. He plays for Shane and Shane now. And he makes these beautiful kits, a 14-inch kick drum with a hole in it. You put a Beta 52 in that thing, it sounds like the biggest kick drum you ever heard in your life. That's sweet. It, it, yeah. His snare drum has got a djembe top. So when the snare is on, it's a snare. Play with brushes or sticks. Flip it off, and it's a hand percussion djembe. Wow, that's okay, sweet. That's cool. The whole kit's 1500 bucks. That's wow. less than yeah. cheap most of the time. Right. That's cool. Well, and there's there's also cymbal solutions out there now with yeah. Sabian and Zildjian. Both have quiet type cymbals. Yep, that's that true. still retain tone. And the other thing too, Michael, is that uh, I don't like shields on drums, but I don't mind shields on cymbals. So they make these things called shy baffles now. They're yeah. big circular plexiglass things. It can redirect because as a sound guy, 
it's that high frequency hash from the symbol that yeah. gets in my vocal mics. Right. I don't know. That's like always been the problem. Control. Right. Yeah. We actually had a guy um, at one of the churches I worked at where he actually made them himself. And then, yeah. he, and then he attached like, so that we could put them on mic stands. Right. So all you'd have to do is purchase a mic stand and it's about so big, yeah. so high. And then I, you would just I put it in where you need it. All. Yeah. I don't mind those at all. So that's great. Because what you can do with those, you can redirect so it doesn't bounce back into the other microphones. Again. Right. 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 So anyway. Hey, Michael, I was watching your live stream the other day, well, maybe a week or two ago, actually. And I noticed your kit on stage is not, not I don't know if that was just because of your COVID and what, but in a normal worship service, do you have Yeah, it's a scaled down there? drum kit, but they pulled it out of the. Out of the drum booth. So normally you're in the drum booth. We are. Okay. It's a fully enclosed, you know, with acoustic ceiling. So it eliminates some of the reflections. And those, right. those can work better. But the thing I don't like about a fully enclosed thing is now the, the drummer is completely disconnected from the band. I totally agree. Yeah, right, so, right, right. I mean, there's pros and cons to everything, right? You got to count the take. cost. I think the band needs to hear the room together. I've heard Buddy Rich in the Blue Note in New York City holds 150 people, and he had a big band in there. And I'm having a conversation with the guy next to me, and I'm like 10 feet in front of the drums. How that happened? It's called mm. skill. <laughs> so whatever money you're going to spend on screens, why don't you spend on drum lessons for the guy? You know? <laughs> yeah, I, I wonder I when it. we're going to get to that. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, condenser microphones. Yeah. <laughs> so one advantage besides frequency and sensitivity is their transient response. Mm. How fast do they respond mm. to the sound? And the faster that you have a, a, a transient, the quicker and more fast that diaphragm has to be. Are you with me? Yep. That's why they're the chosen yep. microphones for recording most of the time. For live sound, okay, you're going to have reflections. You have a live audience. You have all this stuff going on. So you're probably not going to notice the differences as much. But fast transients mean fast relay time to whatever device they're going to. Mm. Recording, live sound, whatever. So that here's a, a screenshot of uh, the condenser on top and a dynamic on the bottom. And you can see how much faster the condenser is mm. from the same input. And then what happens with the dynamic at the bottom, you see like a wave action. That's inertia. That's the voice coil. Once it gets moving, it doesn't stop as fast. Gotcha. <laughs> it keeps kind of it keeps kind of going on a little bit. Where the condenser is like a Porsche, the dynamics like an eighteen wheel tractor trailer. <laughs> who's going to start quicker, and who's going to stop faster? And that just means accuracy. That's all. Subtleties, nuances, all that stuff you might miss with the dynamic. The condenser is going to get it. Right. And the better the condenser, mm -hmm. the better it's going to get. So, that's cool. Um, and that's why so we pay five thousand dollars for a U eighty seven. Yeah, that's not phantom power, by the way. So if you see something like that, you know, avoid it. <laughs> 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 Sometimes you'll see a, an inexpensive mixer that'll have global phantom power, which means when you turn it on, every channel is going to have phantom power, and. People ask, is that going to hurt a dynamic mic that might be on that channel? And the answer is no, unless it's a Radio Shack mic. Then they burst into flames. Which is a good thing. Anyway. Radio who? Does that, <laughs> they don't exist anymore, right? No, they're wired differently. So they don't, it just kind of bypasses it. It doesn't yeah. see it. Okay. So there's large diaphragm condensers or smalls. What's the difference between a large and a small? The size? The size of the diaphragm. Yeah, exactly. The diaphragm, yeah. Exactly, Ty, because one is large and one is small. That's, <laughs> That's why they're called large and small. <laughs> hey. There could be Mine. an argument made that larges will sound warmer, bigger, kind of like a woofer versus a tweeter. Mm. But the truth of the matter is these tiny little sub-miniatures, things like this, the DM20 by Earthworks, they have exactly the same frequency response as a large. And the smaller it is, we just talked about transient response. Which one do you think is going to have a faster transient response? Larger, well, smaller, smaller. Absolutely. Yeah. Back to and inertia proven, again, right? It's proven way faster than any large. So anyway, let's move on. 
applications. We'll, we'll talk about specific applications in a minute. Proper placement, where you put the right mic in the right <laughs> place after the source is, is correct, that's going to make a huge difference. He's singing right into the front of that mic. People say, well, what about plosives? You get these mm -hmm. P's, B's, D's, all these pops. How do you correct that? Technique. Yep. If you put all your hands in front of your mouth for a minute and say, Peter, Paul, just do it with me. So the Peter audience. Paul. Peter, Paul. Peter, Paul. Peter, Paul. You feel the blast of air on your fingers? Yeah. Yes, I do. Okay. So that, that translates into a pop on your PA. And you can try to EQ it and high pass it and all that. But the easiest thing to do is say, can you have the singers keep it that close, but put it just below their lips. Now do the right. same thing with your hand here and say, Peter, mm -hmm. Peter, Paul. And it goes right over yeah. or yeah. off to the side. Yeah. The gain distance is still here. You're still going to get good gain because you haven't moved it away. Right. You're Versus backing up like the this. Force of air is going, yeah. Right? And think about that with speakers, too, on a guitar cabinet. You don't put it on the dust cap. You mm -hmm. put it somewhere between the dust cap and the surround, right? Mm -hmm. So you don't get – you don't put a kick drum mic – even if it has just like a head, you never cut the hole for the head in the center of the drum. <laughs> it's always off to the side. So it's the same kind of thing, right? Yep. Head-worn mics, I prefer these for spoken word, for pastors, for, for theater, uh, only because of gain before feedback. If you use a lapel, which are great for video, not so great for loudspeakers, because lapels are usually down here. And if anyone knows anything about the inverse square law, you know that anytime you double the distance away from the source, you lose mm -hmm. 60 dB of level, right? Right. So compare this to this. There's not enough power in my amplifier to bring that up to where it could be if I just use this in the first place. Right. That's a great looking lapel, by the way. Isn't that great? That was the <laughs> one that was originally invented by Satan to distort the word of God. <laughs> <laughs> I like it. All right. Shotgun stereo mics. These are really cool. I mean, if you've got a, if you've got a stream, like especially people streaming now, I mean, not everything's going to translate to stereo depending on the device you have. But instead of setting up a spaced pair of microphones, a stereo microphone can work very well. Um, for a room, for overheads on drums, even for a small choir. Yes. Ensembles. One mic stand. <laughs> shotguns typically used for audience miking so i would recommend if anybody's doing a, a stream not during a pandemic because the church is empty but when you have a congregation in there make sure that you have some audience mic set up mm -hmm. that puts you in the room with the people when you're listening from afar mm -hmm. you know nothing worse than having a pastor go up to the public and say, hey how's everybody in the house doing this morning and you hear no response you're not going to go to that church or imagine hearing Frampton Comes Alive with no audience mics. I mean, does anybody here remember Frampton Comes Alive? Absolutely. It's a great, a great record, man. <laughs> of course. This is great. I think that Israel Houghton, Danny Duncan was a recording engineer on Israel Houghton's Live in South Africa record. Yeah. He had something like 12 to 16 shotguns on the crowd. Oh, yeah. And oh, he yeah. mixed them as elements. So the crowd always sounded like it was moving. Oh, that's cool. Just use nice. two microphones. You're going to get pretty much the same sound the whole time. So if you have multiples of audience mics, that's even better, which some churches don't even have any. And you don't want to use 57s or 58s. Right. You want to use a condenser or a shotgun, probably a cardioid or a shotgun. And then you want to roll off all the low end. Everything right. like below 350, 400, just take it out. Right. I go, I go a step as to delay it to the PA too. I don't know if you, you end up doing that, but. Yeah. Yeah. Don't put them into your live mix. <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm speaking of broadcast mixing, so. You know, this even, you can even repurpose the ambient mics if you're using them for your in-ear monitors, for your musicians, because I never really start anybody out on in-ears unless I have ambient mics. It just right. sounds too closed off. The advantages of in-ears are stereo, and I can bring in whatever I want to. But people who are worship leaders want to hear the congregation singing. So if I'm closed off, how do I hear them? Ambient mics. Now you can repurpose those too to do your audience miking for your broadcast. Just patch them into that mix. <laughs> That's it, baby. Mm -hmm. Right? 
Ribbons are probably my favorite microphones because they expose harmonics that I don't hear with condensers or dynamics. But heretofore, they've been too fragile or too expensive. And now we have a whole bunch of companies that are making very affordable, very cool ribbon mic. Royer. Right. Uh, AT. Well, I think the first time I ever used a, a ribbon mic on an electric guitar was when I was in Seattle. I think you and I had a conversation, Doug. And... Uh, uh, you were, you know, recommending an AT microphone that was a ribbon mic to use on an electric guitar. And uh, so we got one and it sounded fantastic. I forget the yeah. model of the microphone that I ended up using, but it sounded yeah, amazing. It's in Nashville called Contemporary Music Center. They take 40 students from Christian universities to Nashville for a semester. All they do is write and produce songs. And I went down, we did a shootout on a Marshall cab. He had a great lineup of mics. He had Neumanns and Telefunkens and everything so he had a condenser and he had a 57 on this one and i just put up like a 4081 at right next to it that's the one so he did he did the condenser he did the dynamic he did the combination of the condenser and dynamic then we finally got to the ribbon and the kids in the room everybody in the room i wish i had a picture all their jaws just dropped they went what is that <laughs> and we were the guy was just playing like an open d chord through a marshall stack right and there was harmonics in that thing that you didn't hear on any of the other things. Heck yeah. And I'm going, awesome. like, okay, I, I'm sold. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Just use your but, ears, man. Again, they're bi-directional. In fact, is anybody, I, I'm probably going to sound like a demon worshiper at this point, but I like Will <laughs> Zeppelin. <laughs> I love it. And there's a song yeah. that you call When the Levy Breaks. Okay. Mm -hmm. And the drum sound that opens at that sound mm -hmm. that was in a foyer mic'd with no close mics right they yeah that was when they went to that house right or like castle or something a, like Mick jagger's house or yeah something. yeah yeah up on yeah. a banister two buyer ribbon mics that were at that time unidirectional 15 feet away there was not one close mic on that that's case. crazy so the room the drums and the drummer obviously had a lot to do with it but it just shows goes to show I don't really need to have close mics to get that big organic sound of a drum mm -hmm. set. Right. In a live situation, you can't do that. I get it. You have to mic close. But, man, people are, are blown away when I tell them that. There's no mic on the kick drum. There's no mic on the snare. Yeah. <laughs> Sometimes the best microphones when you're in the studio recording is going to be your room mics. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. You're absolutely right. And that's a cool thing to make, maybe experiment with while the churches are empty, you know? Yeah. Work out the room sound a little bit and uh, see what you can do with that. Anyway, I won't spend time on ribbons because most of the churches are, don't even have a lot of condensers, let alone these particular kind of guys. And these operate a little bit differently. There's usually like a U-shaped magnet. And in the old days, it was like a very thin, almost sheer piece of aluminum that was corrugated that hung in the magnet. So we'll talk about patterns in a minute, but these pick up great from front and back but they don't hear anything on the side. Mm. Okay. That's called a null. We'll, we'll talk about that in a second. Mm -hmm. Any questions so far on the uh, operating principles here? I'm with you. I'm with okay. you. Okay. So the next thing you need to do is learn to desire what sound you want the microphone to pick up versus the undesired sound. And the undesired sound could be a number of things. It could be a, a, an adjacent instrument or a sound source. It could be a wall. It could be some kind of a reflective surface, like a case of a shield with a drum. So is this microphone in a, in a field where it's going to pick up what I want it to and not hear as much of the undesired thing that I want it to? This is where patterns really become important because with a graph, you can basically see the pickup pattern of the microphone. Okay. All right. So mm -hmm. this shows you four diagrams of four different patterns, but there's really only two classifications of polar pattern here. The omni is omnidirectional and the other three are unidirectional. Okay. Got it. Yep. <clears throat> You've heard the word omni. If you're a Bible reader, omniscient, omnipresent, mm -hmm. omnipotent, this is all directions. This is a microphone that has no gift of discernment. Okay. So <laughs> Whatever I put this thing on, it's going to hear not only what you're aiming it at, but to the sides, the top, the bottom, and the back. 
So very rarely, unless you really know what you're doing, are you going to use an Omni in a live situation? Right. The only one you might is your pastor's lapel or his head worn is typically mm-hmm. Omni. Why? Because nobody else is playing right now. <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> and they have some advantages over a unidirectional mic. No proximity effect. And I'll talk about that in a minute. So the closer you get to a microphone, it doesn't get bassier. Okay. It also rejects things like wind noise, turning pages, that kind of thing. Which we all So love. this is a this is a polar plot. It has concentric circles and it has angles or degrees of angle that you can see on the top zero, 90, 270, 180. So it's a bad I should have had a real microphone here, but if this was a microphone, zero, 180, 90. 270? I don't think so. It's all 90. <laughs> okay. mm. mm-hmm. so you'll see that on some, but this is a two-dimensional representation of something that happens three-dimensionally. So you got to try to wrap your head around that a little bit. Well, you're looking from the top down, correct? Right. So yeah. here's a cardioid, on the other hand, which has a shape drawn into it. And it kind of looks like an upside-down heart, which is why they call it a cardioid. So at this very top at zero, that's the most sensitive part of the microphone right here. And on the bottom at 180, you can see where it bends into that heart shape. That's called a null. Mm -hmm. To nullify, to make void, to cancel. So it doesn't hear frequencies back there as much as it does at zero. Zero is the loudest, 180 is the weakest. Yeah. So just to explain to our, li- uh, our listeners or our viewers is that the zero is basically you speaking into the microphone. The 180 is going to mm-hmm. be the back or the handle of the microphone, correct? Right. Where it gets plugged right. in. So another name for zero is what? On axis. When I'm speaking on axis to the microphone, I'm going to be as close to zero as I can. As you go off axis, look, look at what happens at like 45 degrees on this plot. Mm -hmm. Those concentric circles indicate sensitivity. So I'm down about, when I get to about 90 degrees, I'm 10 to 12 dB down from zero. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So don't speak into the side of the mic like the guy in the military taught you to do. (laughs) (laughs) I don't know who taught that trick. Keep it right on your beard and speak over the top of it. That doesn't work so well. Okay. So far, so good. So far, so good. So, these are the easiest mics to aim because you have a sensitive part and a not so sensitive part. So snare drum on access to the snare drum, high hat will be in the null. Yeah. Choir mic on access to the choir. The null will be aimed at the speaker cluster on the ceiling. Worship leader, his voice, the null will be aimed right at his floor monitor. Right. Right. So if you see that as a diagram, it's like, okay, I don't have to be a genius to figure this out. I'm going to aim it here and the undesired sound I want in the back of it. Exactly. Now, not, not all microphones are created equal. I said that the null on a cardioid rejects frequencies. It doesn't really reject too many frequencies that are below 250. So if you've got a lot of bottom end coming out of the worship leader's monitor, that SM58 is still going to hear it, even Mm. though it's aimed at the null. So you might want to high pass your monitors so that that bass frequency stuff doesn't get into the back of that microphone. Yeah, Yeah. that's a great point. Great tip. There are so many people that don't realize this. They think of a cardioid in that null point, but they don't think of it in in terms of frequency. That's That's a great point to bring up. Well, here's the other point. Look at the left. This is a typical cardioid that could be Sennheiser, Sure, AT, anything. And not only the bass frequencies, but look at all the other frequencies. There are some that are super or hyper cardioid. There are some that are cardioid. Mm-hmm. There are some that are omni. The one on the right is an Earthworks. <laughs> I've never seen a microphone do that in my life, mm. where it's consistent frequency-wise to the edges of the pattern. Right. That's, That's interesting. Offensive. That's great. Crazy. 
Absolutely. I was not a believer until I actually heard him myself, but we won't be an ad here. I'm going to move on. This is the hyper <laughs> wave. <laughs> so what do you notice about this one? Where Where is the null on this one? There's actually two. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And there's a big lobe in the back. This yeah. is another mistake that Todd pointed out, you know, not many people know about the frequency with the, with the null, but they just willy nilly think that I can put a monitor behind any microphone. And if you put a monitor behind this one, don't ring it out. Just go up and move the monitor to the null. Right. Right. Yeah. Just move it to the side a little bit. <laughs> okay. Now what's the application for these? No oh, pair of monitors left and right. That's right. That's one. How about mm -hmm. a piano player? Mm. Got a microphone? Where's the monitor typically going to go? He can't put it by his pedals. Can't put it where his music stand is. Yeah, it's so going to be off to the side. So there's another application. How about when you're sharing monitors with somebody? Yeah. Let's say I had three singers. Maybe the middle singer should have a cardioid with a monitor behind them. There's two singers sharing that. Hypercardioids on each side will allow them to have that monitor be in there and all. Yeah, that's a great tip. And yeah, for a lot of churches right. that have pianos, grand pianos, live piano players, um, if you're not using a keyboard, um, that's a great tip because you're going to have that monitor to the side. So you should be using a hypercardioid mic possibly on that singer. So sometimes we just choose mics because the talent or a sound, but sometimes you have to look at the application and what actually is going to work there. I thought we, I thought we chose them based on what it said in the recent trade mag. Right. right. <laughs> now, here's another what Sweetwater has on sale. Yeah. Right. Here's, a, here's a Beta 57. I don't know if anybody knows this, but sure SMs are all cardioid and Betas are all super cardioid. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So here's a super cardioid I'm using on a snare drum. Why? So I can isolate the hi-hat and tom-tom a little better. Yep. Makes sense. Absolutely. Or if I don't have a spare channel for the hi-hat, because there's a big lobe in the back, I can aim the back of that mic to the hi-hat and pick up some hi-hat in the mic. <laughs> if you wanted, right? If you chose to do so. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Phelps. <laughs> <laughs> Here's a typical monitor assignment for each type of microphone. So if you don't know the pattern, you're going to put the monitor in the wrong place. That's good. So you're telling good me that point. Michael Jackson always used a hypercardioid microphone? Who? <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm just wondering because I'm just I just look at a lot of like old concert footage. Sorry to uh uh, bring this up. I just look at a lot of old concert footage and there's like multiple wedges. It's like all over the stage. You, you know? know what else is funny? Even touring pros will do this. Um, I'll see two monitors on the singer and it, they're using a cardioid. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> is it, you sure you want to do that, man? It's like yeah. you've got yeah. two monitors coming into the field of pickup on that thing because it's so wide. Right. 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 Um, mm hmm. Same thing with side address condenser microphones. You've got to know which side to aim it at if it's a cardioid. Right. I've seen guys have two overheads, like, you know, like a KSM 32 or something or whatever it is, and they're aiming it down, and I'm not getting any input into the, to the console. I'm going, would you do me a favor? Would you just turn them around? <laughs> just flip it. And as soon as they turn them around, I'm getting input. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Usually it's a side with the logo on it that that you aim at the talent usually says front. Yeah. The logo yeah, usually says front. front. <laughs> the back has little controls like a, like a high pass or a pad or something. Right. Yeah. You definitely don't want to aim that at the talent because they'll play with it. Okay. Yeah. They'll <laughs> oh, be like, wait, this, what does this, this do? <laughs> <laughs> like this. See what I mean? Yeah. So that, that changes the pattern. There's some microphones that'll actually do multiple patterns. So those are great to have in your toolbox because you can use them for just about any kind of an application, bi-directional, omni, cardioid. So every church should have one or two of those. This is a, what a picture of a bi-directional or a figure eight, like a ribbon, 
like a multiple pattern microphone would have. It's actually two cardioids back to back and your nulls are exactly 90 degrees off axis. Uh, I don't want to go too much into frequency stuff or EQ, but I will say this just briefly on EQ. EQ is a volume control. If you're going to start with boosting, you're going to screw up your gain. Okay. So we want to start by cutting things that are offensive, find the frequencies that are getting in the way and remove those. But in the case of knowing instruments and frequency responses of certain sources, you can actually use your EQ to make the ranges work better for that, like a flute, for instance. Yeah. What's the bottom range of a flute? Well, it's around middle C on a piano, about 260 mm -hmm. hertz, somewhere around there. Flutes don't usually go much below that. What's their top range? About 6, 7K, okay? That's the range of a flute. It's also about the same range as an alto singer in a choir. Mm. So why don't I limit what that microphone will hear then? specific to the range of the source you're miking. So let's roll off high pass 250. <laughs> let's low pass 7K. Mm -hmm. yep. and let's have the microphone work on the range of the singer. That will also limit some frequencies that are coming in from other places of course. that won't affect that microphone as much. That's a great way to use your EQ or your high and low pass filters, if nothing else. Yeah, that's good. That's good. Yeah, knowing exactly what the source is doing is going to help you, um, especially yeah, no, in live sound, the, specifically in live awesome. sound. Now, they actually have RTAs in the back of your EQ screen. Yep. So as a singer singing, you can actually see. Yeah, you can see it. Say, sing your lowest <laughs> note for me. Oh, right. Yeah, it's <laughs> like oh, there it is. <laughs> sing your highest note. <laughs> <laughs> The problem is if you did that on old analog consoles back in the old days, you didn't have any EQ bands left. That's right. That's yeah. Exactly. Yeah. You were limited for sure. Mm -hmm. So we talked about inverse square law briefly, but some of your viewers might not know what that is. And it not only applies to microphones, it applies to your monitors too. Like Jimmy in my church, a made up name. He's not a real character. He likes to stand 12 feet away from his monitor and he goes, Hey Doug, now you turn me up now. <laughs> he never got that right. The scripture says I must increase. Oh wait, no, it doesn't. It says I must be. Anyway, <laughs> I say, Jimmy, take six steps towards your monitor. So as he takes six steps towards his monitor, as long as the speakers are still aimed relatively close to his ears, He's going to hear about a 6 dB increase mm. because he mm -hmm. have the distance to the monitor. It's going to get louder as he gets closer. It's going to get softer as he moves away. Just like in your church. If you're trying to fill a church with two speakers up front to hit the back, you're probably going to kill the people in front and the people in the back are still not going to hear you. So you're going to have to set up a delay ring or something if the church is at large, right? That's another story. That's why in-ear monitors are the perfect extension of the inverse square law. You can't get closer than this, which right. means I can play the amplifiers at a much lower level. Right. right. Same thing with the microphone. As you get closer, it's going to get louder. And if you're going to stay far away from that mic, there might not be enough gain in my system to get you up to where I need you to get. So can you help me out here? Let's teach some proper mic technique to our singers and our, our musicians. Yeah. And, and I'm going to need the worship leaders help in that because sometimes yeah. they don't listen to the tech. Yeah. Every, everywhere that I've worked, it's always been a collaborative effort. And even with volunteers, I would tell them, Hey guys, all of this is a conversation We're 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 one team. It's not like we're the techs and they're the band and the singers. We're all one. And so if we want to get the best result, let's just have a dialogue about it and let's, teach each other right and yeah. i think and again that's taking care of it at the source right before we're talking about miking and eqing and touching knobs let's talk about getting the source right and sometimes it just needs a conversation that's right exactly right and those conversations usually aren't best 10 minutes before a service no <laughs> no <laughs> 
This it's is like, for our math. It's like, hey, lead guitar player, how about turning your rig down just a little bit so I can actually put a mic in front of it? <laughs> sure, no problem. I'll just turn it up when service starts. Yeah, right, right. Now you got this whole battle going on. I don't want to spend a lot of time on this slide. <laughs> <laughs> so let's talk about this. Uh, people don't really understand time alignment phase. Uh, it, it's a big deal. It really is a big deal. If you don't understand this aspect of how slow sound actually is, you have to start wrapping your head around it. Have you ever played the lightning game? Where you, you know, oh, yeah. you teach your kids, you know, don't be afraid because when you see the lightning, let's count one, 1,000, two, 1,000, three, 1,000. If you get to five, that lightning is about a mile away, mm. roughly a thousand feet per second, right? So let's take the concept a step further. Some people think they can fix phase problems with a little polarity switch, but polarity is not the same as phase. <laughs> all, all polarity does is switch something 180 to the other side, mm -hmm. right? which is good if you're doing multiple mics on a snare drum, for instance. If the mics are directly opposite, one's on top of the snare and one's underneath, you might, and I'm saying might, this isn't a rule. You don't automatically flip the phase on the bottom. You listen. Use your ears. Do what sounds good. Right. You listen. And if you flip the one out of phase and it doesn't sound fuller than the first time, then leave it alone. Right. <laughs> or re-aim it or something. Right. Uh, radial has this cool box called the phaser. I don't know if you've seen it. You put mm -hmm. two microphones into it, like two overheads. And you can actually hear by dialing it in where they actually match in phase. Wow, that's sweet. I didn't know that. That's awesome. What's it called? The radial what? The phaser. The phaser, okay. Consider it bought. I guitar, just bought it. Right? Yeah. But the best thing to do is actually use on drums, especially tape measure. Yes. You've got two overheads. You don't want one in the vertical plane or horizontal plane different from the other one. Right. So find something that is a common reference, like a snare drum and measure the distance from the center of the snare to your two overheads. People will go further than this. I'll actually measure mm -hmm. the symbols. And you get crazy with this stuff, but at least do that. Yeah. Because when the snare hits, the sound traveling at a thousand feet per second, will it arrive at both microphones simultaneously and they'll likely be in phase. You can yeah. easily do that with a mic cable as well. Yeah. Or, or, or stick, <clears throat> drumstick. Yeah. Drumstick. Yeah. Right. Um, or another way, instead of using a space pair on your drums, use what's called an XY, which I have a diagram for in a minute. Because when you're using a near coincident pair of microphones, which are typically the exact same kind of mic, they're in one point in space, even though you're getting a true left and right, also good for mono, the sound will arrive at that point in space simultaneously and they'll be in phase. But there's lots of instances where you get things that are slightly out of phase like this. you got a microphone that's too far from the guitar cabinet. Mm -hmm. You've got like a hard surface floor. So now you're going to get direct sound and reflected sound, and the reflected sound is going to be late. It's going to be out of phase. Mm -hmm. So try to get that microphone as close to the source as you can for this application. Or you have two mics on a vocalist who's playing a guitar, maybe one mic would be better if you can find a place where it's picking it both up well. That's kind of difficult. And that usually doesn't happen live. Usually there's a pickup on an acoustic guitar. So when you have microphones that are out of phase, it's called comb filtering. There's electrical comb filtering and there's acoustical comb filtering. I'll explain the difference. Electrical is when you have two mics that are different distances from a source. So let's say you're in a choir, and I see this happen with a lot of small churches. They'll put eight mics on a 12-voice choir. <laughs> Jeez. What, what are you doing? Let's tighten the choir up, and let's start with one mic and see if we can get it. If we have to add them, add them. Yeah. But if, if you don't learn anything else from this, this talk, learn this. Fewer mics most always sounds better than more mics. Right. Preach it. Right. So start with one. Add two if you need to. Because if the center singer 
is like three feet from this and two feet from this one, this one's going to be one millisecond out of phase with that one. Yeah. And it's not going to be a nice smooth curve that you see. Mm -hmm. It's going to be looking like a comb like that. And it sounds unnatural. It sounds distant. Acoustic comb filtering happens when you have one mic with a reflective surface, like a pastor's pulpit mic. Mm. Got a hard mahogany pulpit in a podium mic that might be too short. He's too far from it. So when he speaks, he's going to get reflection off the surface into the mic and direct sound into the mic. Now you have acoustic comb filtering. How do I fix that? Get the mic closer to his voice right. or put egg cartons all over the pulp. You know? <laughs> get some oral legs, put it all around. Yeah. Get that old sleeping bag off the piano and put it on the pulp. <laughs> Pew pillow. Yeah, the electrical that's... comb filtering with a pastor happens. He's got a head worn mic and now he's walking in front of the podium mic. Yeah. And it's all the time. Phone. Yep. What oh, do you yeah. do? Just turn one off. I don't care which one. Choose one. Can always hear it when the pastor is looking down at his iPad now. Yeah. He had a major reflective yeah. surface. Absolutely. It's pretty common now. Even I read an article about, was it Mike Love and the Beach Boys? He had this hard brim baseball cap when he was at a concert. So he's singing into his vocal mic. And he's he's getting reflections off of his hat. Oh wow! <laughs> Don't so wear a hat. Start wearing them backwards. Take Turn your hat around. off. Yeah, just. <laughs> <laughs> I just did a recording clinic with this guy. Who's I don't know how many Grammys he's won. Twenty five. His name's Frank Filippetti. Nice. He won his first Grammy nice. for James Taylor's Hourglass, <clears throat> mm. which was the first time a best record of the year was ever given to a artist where it wasn't recorded in a studio. Ah. He recorded it with two D88s at James's house on Martha's Vineyard. Nice. But he's all about phase. So here he is talking about the measurement of the mics and how he does an X axis with these things. I'll just give you a little anecdote on this. We were in this studio and he asked the studio owner to play back tracks that he was really proud of. And they had just recorded this record by Guster. What great record. There's like 30 engineers in there from Berkeley, University of Miami, all these guys, really pros, studio owners. And they're all like grooving to the track. And Frank's just sitting there and he's, he's just like, you know, you could tell he's hearing something wrong with it. And then the owner starts getting a little nervous. He goes, is, is there something I, I did wrong? He says, can you just do me a favor? Can you go to the snare track and just flip that bottom snare out of phase for me? Mm. As soon as he did, the track went, Phew opened up yeah and then he mm. said and can i just listen to the overheads i have this little plug-in called transient detector and what it does is it measures the snare drum to the overheads and you can line them up with a plug-in it's like 39 bucks it's sweet he did that 10 times better again didn't touch eq didn't touch compression he said you know the way to avoid fixing that in the mix like we just did measure your mics first yeah yeah same yeah awesome. so so i get i get tracks all the time and that's the first thing that you're always the first thing you're always doing is checking your 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 gain your gain staging right but then you're also checking to make sure that things are in phase with each other specifically with drums because you have so many microphones um around one source um if you think the drums is one source collectively um and uh yeah you have to check that in order to really get the track to come alive yeah. There's a technique that uh, was incorporated in the 70s by a guy named Glenn Johns. If anyone wants to read a great book, pick up Sound Man by Glenn Johns. He's the uh, Rolling Stones, Eagles, some Beatles records. Nice. I mean, so many. And he started out just as an apprentice getting coffee, hanging out in the studio. Uh, but he came up with the Glenn Johns technique. And it's a great technique for recording, and it's a great technique for for house of worship because it's a minimal miking scheme that gets you this very full sound on your drum kit. It can be done with three mics, typically four. So instead of having two overheads like this, you'll put one directly over the snare and then the other overhead you'll put off to the side. So it's almost parallel to the top of the floor tom tom. Okay. And then what you do is you measure the distance from the snare drum to the overhead and the snare drum to the one that's near the floor, and they're the same distance. 
Okay. Then a kick and a snare, four mics, great stereo or great mono. You get the whole kit. It's just ridiculous. That's sweet. And I took it to Carl Albrecht one time at a conference, and he had, he uses it every chance he gets now, recording and everything. Oh, he's awesome, he'll man. He'll it on a thousand records. <laughs> I'm trying that on my next session. It's right. happening. You can look it up, too, if you get confused. Just look up Glenn John's technique. Okay. YouTube's got like a thousand videos on it. Some are not so good, so you got to look for the good ones. But this is the XY I was talking about. Instead of using two mics spaced pair, Use two mics in what's called an XY. So now you can see that the drum sounds from any angle are going to arrive at that one point in space at time in phase. Don't mic a choir like that. Oh, my. <laughs> <laughs> Man. The mics are too far away, and there's too many of them. You got to get the mics closer and fewer. Mm. Um, we just did the Getty conference and they had 12 KSM 32s on their 300 voice choir last year. And it sounded like crap. Oh, wow. So we went with flex wands from earthworks this time, again, even to the edges of the pattern, mm -hmm. we were able to use six for 300 voices. And it sounded like they were just in the room singing with us. There was no like weird artifacts or comb filtering or, and it was ridiculous. That's cool. But with any mic, I would just say, just use fewer to start with. Draw your choir in an imaginary line down the middle and put two there. If you need more, draw two lines and put one over each section so there's not a lot of overlap. I don't know how many of your churches are using choirs still, but I think it's an emerging thing that's coming back. Yeah. I think well, I can, uh, I can attest to this because I was I was working with a 100-voice choir for uh, over a, almost a full decade. And when I walked into the building, there was eight KM 184s on the Squire, four on the back row, four on the front row. And I worked with it for a while because that's what the church I've been doing. But I tried everything under the sun. I've switched everything around, spent tons of time working on that. And I actually ended up with the Flex Wands. Wow. Just three of them. That yeah. same exact picture. And Boom. it was fantastic. I remember you telling me about that when you first did it, Michael, and you were like, dude, you got it. You got to check these out, man. These flex ones yeah, are just amazing. It was amazing. It's, it's like, you know, I worked for Sure for so long. I worked for AT. And again, a little plug for Earthworks. I never believe the hype of an Earthworks mic. Says, no mic is physically capable of doing that. Until I got in a room with a drum set and I put their DK7 mm -hmm. up. And I just put them up willy-nilly. And listened to the drums in the room. And then I turned the faders up. And it sounded exactly like the drums in the room, but louder. That's sweet. And the only thing I had to do was high pass a little bit. No EQ yeah. anywhere. They're flat as pancakes. You know, the other thing with those flex wands is we had suspended choir monitors at a 45-degree angle from the choir. And there was a massive amount of rejection from yeah. the rear. They don't mm. hear anything in the back. They don't hear anything from the rear. No. They do a demo in there when they're doing an exhibit somewhere. They'll have five Genelec powered monitors and they pump a, a singular voice, like an acapella thing. And they have their flex wand in front of it. And you can put headphones on and listen to it. You can hear even from the edges how even it is. And then they turn the thing around. On a, it's like a little lazy Susan stand that they have the flex wand on. And when they turn the back of the mic toward the speakers, you don't hear a thing. Wow. It's weird. <laughs> That's cool. It's magic. <laughs> it's magic. <laughs> so anyway, yeah, they're piano mics. Again, really great. Boundary mics. We didn't talk about those too much. Um, boundaries are kind of cool in various applications. Um, you can see here with a podium mic, you'll get some acoustic comb filtering because of the reflection of the surface. Boundary mics work with the reflection. So the reflection and the direct sound happen simultaneously. That's the whole key to them. But you need really a hard surface for that to be used to full effect. Mm. The, uh, the con to that is we see a lot of boundary mics used inside of kick drums for the beater. Yep. And um, they're usually on a pillow. So they don't really care about that as much as they do getting just the snap and the crackle of the beater combined with the one either in the hole or with a sub kick outside. Um, that's why they're using theater. In fact, I was experimenting with churches who refuse to 
put their screens out. I said, all right, then let's do this. Let's take your overheads down. We'll keep the snare and the kick on there. And I'm going to put boundary mic one or two stereo on your shield. Think about it. Mm. Now the direct sound and the reflection are happening simultaneously. Mm. <laughs> and instead of having an overhead and free space, which is getting direct and reflection, I'm cutting down on the reflection and direct being different. How did that sound? It sounded yeah. great. Yeah, that, mean, that makes a lot of sense. It doesn't make any boundaries, but when I had AT, I was playing with them and seeing what I could get. It was pretty cool. That's cool. I'm really to make disappointed. I'm disappointed I never thought of that. Yeah, Back right? That day. makes so much sense. I'm like, wait a second. Let me just get some Back, Velcro. Back in the day, we used to take uh, yeah. no, PZMs and mount them on two or three foot sheets of plexiglass and hang them in front of a choir. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Even for it room lights, nice. a lot of people mount them on a the back wall. Mm-hmm. They don't look very nice, but <laughs> they don't. Yeah. They worked well. <laughs> It would it would be better if they made him in the shape of Luke's X Wing fighter. That would look better. That would look yeah, cool. Be cool. Right. <laughs> I, I have put I have put him on the underside of a piano lid. Yeah. Yeah. That, I've, that, that worked or on the inside wall of a grand piano. I've done that. Too. Right. Mm. Yeah. Um, so here's the uh, issues of feedback. This is these are the only cures, and this is right from the Sure book. So I'm I'm giving them full credit here. You don't have enough gain before feedback, then move the mic closer to the talker. I had to say talker because if you say speaker, that increases feedback. Yes, yes, <laughs> not to the speaker. <laughs> move loudspeaker closer to the listener. Reduce the number of open mics. A lot of people, so let's talk about that for a minute. When people are setting gain, which is all over the place, I don't think a lot of people still know how to set gain correctly in a lot of churches. Um, and when they do, sometimes they're mixing with the gain instead of the fader. Yeah, isn't that a volume now? Which, yeah. <laughs> they'll set, like the old Mackie manual said, set every channel to zero. Zero. Right. <laughs> right. They did too. Right. So now I eight drums that. are playing at zero and the meters are completely in the red. Mm-hmm. Why? Because you didn't adjust downward 3 dB for every time you double microphones. Mm. Mm-hmm. So if you've got eight mics on at once, you can't have all your channels set to zero. Right. You got to have it around minus nine, minus 12 for each of those if they're all playing at the same time. And people don't think of that. And then with digital mixers, it's even worse. They're still trying to set it at zero on a digital console. Right. Where minus 12 to 16 is equivalent to zero on an analog. Right. Mm-hmm. Right. So think about that. Move the loudspeaker further from the microphone. Uh, you can reduce system gain feedback frequencies if you know how. A lot of people don't know how to ring out a monitor right. or ring out the mains. We'll have to do a whole podcast on just ringing out a monitor. Even if you're using a graphic EQ, that that's maybe even going to sound. I just cool. use one of them you know, auto so feedback cool. eliminators. Yeah. Those are cool. Right. <laughs> anyway, there's no other solution. <laughs> anyway, that's that's that. Uh, I'll go back to seeing my ugly face. I got a yeah. great face for the radio. Yeah, man. You got no, you got a great face, yeah. man. I love seeing you. Um, but How that, was, that? was that okay? That was really amazing. Good? That was really yeah, great was and kind of really broke things down. And uh um I think I, I mean I even got some stuff out of that that I'm gonna be applying this upcoming week, right? Um and so um any final thoughts, guys, any questions you might have to just kind of uh throw at Doug while we got him here? No. All right. Is that a no? The, the intriguing thing to me yeah. was, which has kind of got me thinking, I mean, I'm, I'm in a small church. I mean, drums, you know, drums have found their way into churches like, you know, and it's, it's usually the biggest culprit on stage to try to deal with. Let's be honest with it. Right. And a lot of our small churches are all implementing drums. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm really intrigued by your, the discussion you had about shields. It's kind of changed my thinking on a few things and I may get next time I get in church when I can get in church. Yeah. Hopefully, hopefully in Michigan here, that's about two weeks from now, three weeks, yeah. maybe. <laughs> right. I'm going to start playing around with some things because, you know, we have a fully enclosed, you know, enclosed booth. So, and we got a lot of mics in there. And I haven't, I've not thought a lot about phasing, you know, and the whole discussion about, um, plexiglass shields. We got to, we have some, 
uh, absorptive top on ours, but it's probably that, a lot that of helps. Things. That helps for sure. There's yeah. probably a lot of things going on inside that drum booth that are probably real kosher. So I think the thing is, you want to go all or nothing. You know, there's a yeah. lot of people that throw an open kit with just a shield in front of it and just wreaks all sorts of havoc. Yeah. Yeah, I would agree with that. Just do all or nothing. And you have to think about the pros and cons. Um, If you're using a lot of volunteers um, to play drums, you know, you may have one really great drummer who has incredible feel and really gets it. But it's really hard to keep uh, the source to be consistent when you're using so many different people. Uh, You can grow into that over time. But to think that you're going to get that sort of results in a month um, is unrealistic. And so you have to weigh those pros and cons and say, okay, when do we use the, the, a drum cage? When do we not? That sort of thing. So I well, think it, it goes needs back to be open to what you dialogue. were saying, Doug, is it, it does always start with a source and right. the artist right. and the, start you know, the there. instrument. Yeah, even where you're going to put mics, you want to talk to the artist to make sure they're not getting in his way. Mm-hmm. So some compromises are going to have to be made, right? It's the same thing with a grand piano, right? So, have a so you think piano. maybe... When I walk into a work with a church and they got a full shield around their drummer and he's still by far the loudest thing on the entire stage, I should go have a conversation with him. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, you know what? Stanford, like, University dude, like you're, you're, uh, you're way too loud. On, uh, on drummers and shields. And they found out that because of the shield, they had a right to play louder. Mm. because it was going to mitigate Mm. as opposed to being in the room. And this is where the full enclosure is not as, I'm not as fond of it. Although it's better for the sound, it's not as good for the drummer because the drummer has no way of modifying his level according to what's going on in the room. He has to imagine it almost. He has no idea if he's playing louder or softer than he needs to be because all he's getting is a mix. And most of the time he can do his own mix. So, right. (laughs) Yeah, um, and really the days of wedges are are going pretty far away they, they in the are. church. Yeah, which, yeah. when you the last time open, you sold a wedge, yeah. <clears throat> when you had an open drum kit with a wedge, you could hear the room. Yeah, you know, you could oh. play to the room. Yeah, right. yeah. yeah. I, to answer your question, Todd, only when I do like one off live events, that's pretty much it. When you need right. a, a wedge, but like for an established kind of place, almost everybody's moving to in ears now, man, and. um yeah, so but that's another conversation. I had one other thought, too, about overheads on drums. There's a lot of churches that are putting two overheads up, but they're not recording in stereo, and they're not even in a stereo PA, or let alone a fully immersive PA. So why not just use one mic for your overhead? Mm. You don't think you can get that whole drum kit with one condenser? Oh, yeah. Maybe a kick Absolutely. in an overhead. Maybe add a snare to right. more articulation, but start. I'll play you a million jazz records. Really have one overhead and a kick. Right. <laughs> <laughs> that might be enough for the the in ear monitor person to know that there's my drums. I don't need eight channels of drums on my Avion. You know. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. For sure. Keep it simple. That's it. Yeah. You simple. Know? Start with simplicity. Yeah. Keep it simple. Yeah. yeah. Well, that's awesome. Uh, any I'll another thought, Todd? You guys, about those drums you're talking about too. Oh, well, let me put them up on out. the. Uh, let me put them up on the screen. Yeah, put them up Show on the screen real quick. Yeah. Was that Yamaha you were talking about? The, uh, what do we got here? If I can get here. Uh, we're just seeing your uh, your bar there. Yeah. No, I'm going to try to get. Uh, let's see. We could also provide the links for people in the show notes and also on uh, on our yeah. YouTube. Designs. You see it yet or no? No. No, it's not pulling up. It's just showing us your bar. So you may want to unshare and then reshare. Okay. see it now no we still don't see it but we do see the 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 url there parishdrumdesigns.com yeah uh, definitely go there check those out um i'm actually intrigued by those as well 
um, for smaller rooms. Um, it makes dark symbols too, which are beautiful. They don't have all that high frequency crap. That's like, cool. Anyway. Yeah. No, that's fun, awesome. Guys. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. Appreciate Thanks, Doug, for being a part of our yeah, podcast. Thanks, we really, really appreciate it. Really appreciate it. it. Very nice.